The good news is, this is the most important book ever. <laughs> and I am the most modest speaker at Anarchapulco. <laughs> now, I want to tell you a little bit about why and how I got to this point. And, and first, I, I do have to take a, a, a pretend to strike a note of humility in the sense that I, I really got a lot of help writing this book. For me, creating this was not about any brainchild of mine so much as taking the best wisdom behind the message of freedom and putting it in the simplest, shortest, most easy to understand format, most easy to share with other people. And the way I actually wrote this was I just took all of your best Facebook status updates and tweets and organized them into a 100-page book. <laughs> I started writing Freedom when I was in jail a couple of years ago. And as, as Jeff pointed out last night, I went to jail for a long time and I came out and I said, I wrote a book. And he goes, yeah, and it's a freaking pamphlet. <laughs> but that's the point. My start in activism was with Iraq Veterans Against the War. For those of you who have seen my, my ink, thank you. Um, by the way, wearing a t-shirt or a hoodie that says Iraq Veterans Against the War in 2008 was by far the easiest way to get laid anywhere in America. <laughs> Nobody cares anymore and they're relatively irrelevant at this point. But for me that, I, I used to tell my story a lot. I used to talk about what it was like joining the Marine Corps and why that was important to me. And you know, it's true that sometimes People who come from the understanding of the message of freedom, like so many of you, when you, when you look at the state, anybody, well, feel free to shout out some answers to this. How does the state make you feel? I think I'm hearing more body functions than words, but that's okay. That's, we're, we're open to free expression here, right? <laughs> So, when, when we, <laughs> yeah, really, when you understand how pathetic government is, it really should ultimately make you feel a lot better about yourselves, right? <laughs> and <sighs> when I enlisted, it was because I wanted to have my life on the line for something I believed in. Now, there was a lot of sick shit behind that decision, obviously. A lot of propaganda, a lot of conditioning. But there's a noble intent, too. And when we're just expressing that anger and that frustration and that... What, what was the sound again? Okay, thank you. Well, the title of this talk is supposed to be Communication That Wins Converts. But this isn't going to be a seminar presentation where I say, well, you know, if you stand up straight and talk like this and listen like this. No, because I, what I want to share is something that to me is a lot deeper and a lot more important than that. So when we come from that position of, of anger or, or, or a negative emotional reaction to government, no matter what we're saying, what we've done is ceded our sovereignty to circumstance and external authority and say, 
to the world. I'm not really free. In fact, my truth that I want to share doesn't even make my life better. It just makes me pissed off. And I went through a lot of that myself. And you know what? It's been, it's been a real honor. I, I don't say that, you know, I say that lightly a lot of times, but in this sense, I say it in, 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 in really the deepest sense from, from the core of my being. It is an incredible honor to be, to be alive right now, to be part of this movement, to have gone through what I have gone through. And some of you know a, a, a pretty public transformation. I mean, for, not, not just from a Marine to where I am now, but even as an activist, going from the guy who wanted to do nothing more than punk the cops on his block to being truly, deeply committed to moving humanity forward. And when I enlisted, I was 17 years old, and I... I really thought that being a part of the first to fight was important to me, hence Marine Corps. I really thought that, well, if our politicians say that somebody deserves to die, what an honor to be on the other end of that trigger. If politicians say that someone deserves to die, I want to be the one to kill them. It's pretty fucking sick, right? Sad thing is, it's pretty typical. It's all the bullshit that we're raised with in America today, right? And in that mentality, <laughs> I was actually really disappointed that I didn't get to go and be a part of the invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq. And in 2004, as a reservist, as a college student, I volunteered to transfer from my reserve artillery unit. By the way, one of the reasons I'm good at projecting is because I'm always that asshole at parties who talks too loud because my hearing sucks. <laughs> artillery. I volunteered to transfer to a civil affairs unit. And I was actually against the invasion of Iraq. As a college student, I thought it was a bad policy. I thought, you know, hey. And, and I looked at it from a pretty shallow perspective of, you know, America's just not going to get its money's worth out of this. <laughs> yeah. And when I was there, I was still, I, I called myself a libertarian. You know, by the way, just a little sidebar about this conference. At some point, Jeff must have been like, wait, everybody in the libertarian movement is starting to call themselves anarchists. If we just call our conference the anarchist conference, it's the biggest anarchist conference in the world. And, and I, I just point that out because of the, the semantics of it, but it's relevant also to my story in the sense that I went from being, well, I'm a fiscally conservative, socially liberal constitutionalist, and God damn it, I got it all figured out, and fuck you, you're wrong. And I was arguing with people. And I was torturing people in Fallujah, literally. There was a time when I was there during the siege of Fallujah in April 2004 that the infantry company we were attached to came under some fire. I was on a six-man civil affairs team. We got to be a little bit autonomous, relatively speaking, within the military context, of course. And we were called to do a medevac, medical evacuation of a Marine who had been shot. And we had these, I, people remember, you know, from, from, from back in the beginning of the Iraq War, Donald Rumsfeld and body armor and vehicle armor issues, right? It, we had pretty good flak jackets with, with ceramic plates in them for bulletproofing. <laughs> and we were hiring translators and giving them the 1970s Vietnam era flak jackets. 
And even the ones that we had for the environment that we were in with IEDs and shrapnel and things like that weren't really adequate. I don't know if you guys saw this, but this was really a cool invention that went along with the Iraq war. For the flak jackets, you might have seen this. We called it the cock flap. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? It's this little flap of, uh, of Kevlar material that would just, and we'd wear this like a bib and it would flop around and... I was a driver. And you know what we did with those? We put them on our shoulders. Because if an IED's coming in from the side or fire's coming in from the side and you have this big hole in your flak jacket here, well guess what? It's a big vulnerability, right? And the Marine who had been shot he was wearing his cock flap, and he got shot through the armpit. And the bullet went in and lodged next to his spine. And my team was following a Humvee with him and a corpsman in it on the way to a field hospital. And when we got there, we pulled up behind him. The guys in the Humvee that he was in couldn't open the tailgate because it had all these water jugs and, and, and uh, gas cans in it. So I jumped out and ran up and, and leaned against it to take the weight off and we opened the tailgate and we got him out on a stretcher and now I'm standing there on the stretcher and his arm flails off. Lance Corporal Frank. And... <laughs> What do you do in that situation, right? I mean, there's, it's kind of automatic. So you're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. We made it. We finally made it. You're here. And I found out five minutes later that he had died because he bled out from internal bleeding. And I, I don't mean to... To harp on, you know, the, the tragedies of my life, because we've all experienced something like this, even if not directly. I mean, a lot of people, I, 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 with my uh, amazing fiance Macy, who's going to be entertaining you far more than I in a few minutes. I mean, you didn't get up early to, to cry with me. You got up early to learn how to use psychedelics, right? <laughs> uh, we, we just went on a national tour. We were on the road uh, promoting the book for six months straight. We did 120 events in 180 days. And I, I'd like to think uh, of all the activists in the movement I have, the best, if not close to the best, body of anecdotal evidence in my head from having met people and talked to people. And the question I like to ask people most is, how did you wake up? You know, what led to this? And, and I kind of separate that into a couple of different things because nobody who grew up with the perfect life and was the, you know, head of the cheerleader squad or captain of the football team is going to be pissed off enough to really start questioning things, right? And this is really important to understand who we are as a movement. <laughs> We're not those people. Have you noticed? What a bunch of misfits and outcasts we are. We are the ones who have felt the pain of statism one way or another, whether it was directly or because you're just so goddamn empathetic that when you read the news, your heart bleeds like mine does. But there's a separate element of this that's more important than that. And it's what you do with that motivation. Because you can wake up and stay confused and angry, and you can keep ceding your sovereignty intellectually, spiritually, emotionally to people around you, to external authorities. 
But the real waking up isn't the start of that process. It's the end of that process. It's when you come to that point of, I like to call it Zen libertarianism. And you know, it's really beautiful to see that it's not just me, but that so many other people in this movement are getting it at that deeper level. One of my favorite activists is John Bush. Brave New Books, Austin, anybody? Yeah, okay, great. Couple hands. He was giving a brief history of the movement and was saying, okay, so then 9-11 happened and we started to wake up and we were angry and we wanted to wave signs and, and, and grab people by the collar and tell them 9-11 is an inside job and then we... And then we got all pissed off about the Iraq war and we were anti-war activists. And then it was the NSA and we were fighting for privacy. And, and then we realized, no, it's, it's really the Federal Reserve that's behind everything. And then we were like, oh my gosh, no, it's not even that. There's a new world order behind it. And now, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grow some vegetables. <laughs> And I'm going to meditate. And I'm going to do yoga. And I'm going to love myself. And I'm going to respect real freedom here. So, I've had a luxury of being a full-time activist who gets to sit around and think about these things all the time. As Macy will tell you, I, I don't really like to sleep as much as I like to stay up and think and be on my computer and, and read. And one of the things that's wrong with us is that we just ask why. You ever have a kid, and any parents here who have kids who just won't stop asking why? Yeah, a couple <laughs> enthusiastic but timid hands for that one. And when you ask why about government, there aren't really any good answers when it comes down to it, right? But I got to that point and I didn't stop. You know, a lot of us are tempted, just the way that our minds work, to think, okay, I got it figured out, uh -uh -uh. I did the math, constitutionalism, liberty, freedom, whatever, all right, go back into the world and, and try to function with that, right? My mind doesn't do that. And I think what makes a lot of us here and in this movement right now, the people who are the early adopters of this, how we actually think differently is that we can't just let it go, you know? And, and it's a good, it's a double-edged sword because being truly free and truly happy, and this is, this is what I think is the, is the real importance of psychedelics, aside from so many other amazing things that Macy's going to tell you about, but there's an overwhelming feeling that you can get, whether it's through meditation or whatever it is that you do to, to get that sense of centeredness, but psychedelics kind of force upon you a, a, a very deep, visceral feeling that everything is right in the universe. And you don't need the drugs for that, and you shouldn't. If you can, you should probably experience it that way too, but... It's obviously deeper than that. It's, it, it's, it's transcendent of that. And what my mind has done, and, and what I see so many others of you doing now, and what I see and what I hear in the conversation in this movement around this message, is... A new kind of forward-looking attitude. And, and I describe it as the asymptote. Now, for the math nerds out there, you know that an asymptote never actually gets vertical, right? Never actually hits 
the line to which it is approaching. But from the perspective of our puny human brains, when we see all of the essential dynamics of the human experience accelerating now with technology in a way that couldn't have been seen when Rothbard was writing 40 years ago. Now we can look forward and we can see where this is going. And it's so beautiful to see that, that, that you know, I mean, just, just, just ponder the implications of Moore's law for a few minutes in relation to the issues that we think about in terms of freedom and government. The exponential increase in computing power is driving productivity and medical technology and communication and connectedness. And with the internet, it's even driving spiritual awareness. It is driving self-awareness. It is driving mental health. And as far as we can tell, it might as well be vertical already now. These things are changing so fast, it almost makes government laughable. Every single day, it is becoming more and more obsolete. And again, the technology is kind of a double-edged sword too, right? I know a lot of you have expressed fears about this. And nuclear weapons you know, should have been bad enough, right? But who knows what DARPA's working on now, right? And I look at this and I take my experience. I know, you know, you've all had something, right? And increasingly, it's everyone. Literally everyone can point to some way that living under statism has directly negatively impacted their lives from an arrest to a family member's incarceration to a parking ticket that meant one less load of groceries. And as much as I see this incredible evolutionary leap that we are just starting right now, at the same time I look back. And so what I've done for myself is I've created this ridiculous burden because I see this, because I get this, because I'm in a position to do something about it, and so are all of you. So guess what? <laughs> the more I share my burden, the lighter it gets for me. So get ready to carry some weight. Because you know what? I feel a little guilty being here. People are suffering. And I'm in a position to do something about it. And I'm enjoying the beach in Acapulco. And you can't do that. You know, you can't beat yourself up. You can't, you can't stop taking care of yourself. That's what I do. That's, I, I'm, I'm a little manic that way. Because that's what motivates me. <laughs> How can I take this time to relax when I could be waking someone else up. Because every day less that the state exists is one less day of death and pain and suffering. Yeah. So on that note, I'll talk about my book some more. Since I have one minute left here, and uh, I get the honor of introducing the next speaker. It's not enough to share your anger or your pain or your frustration. We have to be honest about what it takes to do this. It's about winning converts to a different way of thinking, to thinking for yourself and embracing your own freedom. And so I wrote this to be the ultimate conversion tool. 
I wrote this to be the easiest way to share this message with someone else. It's not my idea. I take no credit for anything that's in here, only for how it's put together. And even that, I have to say, I had a lot of help. And my challenge to you and the challenge that I made on the tour that I make to everyone about this book is read it. By the way, it's 2016. You can listen to the audio book and tell people that you read it. That's cool. It's free here. It's free online in every digital format possible. We have the Chinese translation coming out on Monday. We have people working on Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic right now. It's really incredible to see how people have embraced this because they see what it is as a tool. My challenge to you is to read it. And if it's not the most effective way for you to share what is most important to you with the people around you, then find what is for yourself and do that because I guarantee you that is the activism, that is the life, that is the way to engage with humanity and to enjoy this incredible historic moment that we are so fortunate to get to experience right now how you will get the most satisfaction. So thank you very much. Thank you for being a part of this with me. I want to be a spy water beneath the Mexican sky. Drink some margaritas by swing the blue lights. This is Adam Kokesh. Thanks for watching. Please share this video and support this production by going to patreon.com slash adamkokesh.